In the aftermath of 9-11, investigators from the American Society of Civil Engineers began studying what was left of the World Trade Center. These were hollow sections. Mm -hmm. it like it's been around up there. This would be an interesting piece for the fire guys. Yeah. yeah. Well. Tasked by the federal government to try to determine what caused the collapse, the team was given six months to come up with some answers. Part of the column extended from 439 to 41. The group's leader was Eugene Corley, whose experience with the Oklahoma City attack made him the logical choice for lead investigator. On the morning of April 19, 1995, Timothy McVeigh, a homegrown terrorist, parked a rental truck in the loading zone of the Alfred A. Murrah Federal Building. The Murrah Building contained regional offices of the Secret Service, DEA, and ATF, federal anti-crime agencies. And McVeigh and friends were angry at the federal government. The truck was filled with ammonium nitrate and fuel oil. By coincidence, there was a hearing going on across the street, and they had a tape recorder going. There were no cameras to record the event, but this audio tape would prove central to Corley's investigation. And it starts out with the people talking about the water resources hearing. Basically, there are four elements that I have to uh, receive information regarding. The tape recording would give Corley critical information for analyzing the attack. So we needed to find out how long it took the building to collapse. And this shows the graphic output from the sound tape. And it starts out with the people just talking. Uh, then uh, we were able to analyze where the blast occurred, which is this section right here, this very small section. Then there's a slight pause followed by very loud sounds of the building collapsing. That is a period of approximately three seconds. With only three seconds, no one had time to get out. Most died because the building collapsed on them, not from the bomb itself. But why did the Murrah building, a modern structure built to strict government standards, collapse so easily? This was the central question in Corley's investigation. The Murrah building had been very well designed and the records indicated it was well constructed. The Murrah building was nine stories tall, supported by 11 columns spaced 20 feet apart on the upper floors. And on the lower floors, the designers created an attractive two-story lobby by reducing the number of columns to six, which opened up the space. To do this, it was necessary to put a transfer girder in. This is a very strong girder that supports every other column from above and takes the loads from those columns into the more widely spaced columns over the first two floors. McVeigh parked the truck in a service drive just outside the lobby. McVeigh had left the truck right there at column G20. The explosion created a very large crater in the street and took out column G20. It also took out column G24 and G16. This left the large transfer girder with just three supporting columns, and it couldn't hold the weight. Once the transfer girder fails, there's no longer any support over most of its length, and almost half of the building collapses immediately. Whether McVeigh knew what he was doing or whether it was luck, he parked it in the place that it would do the most damage to the building. In engineering terms, what happened in Oklahoma City is called a progressive collapse, the worst case scenario for any structure. A progressive collapse is when a key member of a building is knocked out for some reason and the collapse of the building extends well beyond where that local damage occurred. The Murrah building met all the building codes. But those codes did not require major structural features like the transfer girder to have a secondary support system. In this case, stronger base columns or additional underpinning that tied the girder more firmly into the end columns might have prevented the collapse. In the wake of the 1995 disaster, Corley's team recommended that backup systems to prevent progressive collapse become mandatory. 
but the codes were never changed. Back and forth, and it, and it was still standing. It was a scary situation. It was actually the first time that I had truly ever thought that I might die. Scores of people on the planes and in the buildings were killed instantly. But despite the immense force of the impacts, the building stood. For one hour, 42 minutes in the case of the North Tower, and 56 minutes for the South. The Murrah building had collapsed in three seconds. The towers did not suffer an immediate progressive collapse because their great mass helped them absorb some of the initial shock. And because the buildings had the kind of engineering features the Murrah building lacked. Beginning with a dense palisade of steel columns on the exterior walls, originally placed there by Leslie Robertson to resist the force of the wind. That whole issue of wind engineering is the most important part of the structural design of any very tall building. This wall of columns would prove very fortuitous. Although extensively damaged, the sheer number of columns gave the building added support. What happened was that the loads that were being carried by those columns arched across the opening so that the columns adjacent to the hole now started picking up the loads that had been carried by those where the airplane went in. And in a prescient decision, Robertson placed an additional support system called a hat truss on the top floors of the buildings. By connecting the interior core columns to the stronger exterior columns, the hat truss helped the severely damaged core remain standing. The hat truss prevented earlier failure of the core of the building, which contained all of the stairwells. Had the core failed earlier, there would have been a much larger loss of life than we actually saw on 9-11. But in the end, the buildings did come down, and those who made it out will never forget. Tidal wave of, of destruction just flowed. And the man kept saying, we are the lucky ones. Keep going, we're the lucky ones. We're the lucky ones. We lost 61 dear friends that we worked with and laughed with uh, for years. I'm deeply saddened that they are here. By not collapsing immediately, the towers saved many lives. But a key question remained. Did their ultimate failure mean something was wrong with their design or construction? After several months of intensive study, the American Society of Civil Engineers delivered its verdict. The buildings we found performed well, and there was no trade-off of safety for economy in construction. It was the combination of the impact load doing great damage to the building, followed by the fire that caused collapse. But these conclusions did not satisfy some family members of the 9-11 victims. Upset at what they felt was a hasty and incomplete investigation, they began demanding a more thorough one. We're asking for everyone to join us, and we're asking for God to bless us today that we will have safe buildings and we can go on with the future of this city the way we want to. Thank you very much. In truth, Corley was given scant time and resources to come up with anything but a preliminary conclusion. And a tragedy of this magnitude certainly warranted more than that. So in 2002, Congress charged the National Institute of Standards and Technology to conduct the most detailed building analysis ever undertaken. The biggest hurdle for the NIST team was the lack of physical evidence they had to work with. For most investigations, you usually have a building to investigate. So we had to recreate in great detail what happened on 9-11. And that's why the need for a painstaking reconstruction of the entire process. They looked at a thousand hours of videotape, meticulously measuring the visible damage. They tracked temperatures inside the buildings. They staged model fires to measure their effect on everything from office furniture to steel columns. And they created computer models to help them assess the extent and location of the damage. All in an effort to understand exactly how and why the towers fell. Their prime suspect was the building's floor trusses. When construction began on the towers in the 1960s, 
Leslie Robertson stabilized the tall steel columns with the building's floors. And the large, heavy floors were supported by thin steel members called trusses. By connecting the exterior and interior columns, the floor trusses were critical to the building's support system. If the trusses or their connections failed, floors could collapse and the buildings could fall. Soon after 9-11, there was a lot of concern about the role of the floor trusses from the experts who had looked at the buildings as well as from the lay uh, public. And so we wanted to make sure we looked at this carefully and with full detail so that we could then make a definitive finding. NIST computer simulations show the mostly aluminum planes shredding on impact, but the steel engines tore through multiple floor trusses, and the fast-spreading fires subjected them to intense heat. So in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, many experts wondered if these trusses were too weak to handle a building under stress. Had the floor system been more robust with much stronger connections between the exterior and the inside, I think the buildings probably would have lasted longer. Would they ultimately have collapsed? Maybe not. Another suspect was the fireproofing that covered the trusses and other steel members. It was clearly blown off by the airplane impacts, leaving the steel exposed to the fires. Once you lose the spray fireproofing, you have bare steel. And once you have bare steel, you don't have a fire rating anymore. Prior to 9-11, the public, I believe, felt that uh, steel was fireproof and uh, was not affected by fire. In fact, all building materials are affected by fire. Uh, when the temperature goes up, each building material that is used uh, loses strength. This was particularly true for the lattice-like floor trusses. They were thin and difficult to fireproof evenly. And after extensive testing, NIST found that some of the longer trusses did not meet the two-hour fire rating mandated by the building code. But as they studied the minute details of the collapse, they made a remarkable discovery. One that would not only provide a final verdict on the trusses, but would completely revise previous theories of how the towers fell. In 2002, NOVA depicted a scenario envisioned by many experts at the time, that the truss connections failed in the extreme heat, causing the floors to fall onto one another, precipitating the collapse. When you did it previously, you showed that the floors actually pancaked and we did not see any evidence of pancaking in the videos or photographs we have. By creating computer-enhanced images of the exterior walls, NIST discovered that the truss connections did not fail. In fact, the trusses stayed connected to the columns even as they sagged from the heat. They pulled on the columns, bowing them inward nearly five feet in some areas until the columns reached the breaking point. Suddenly the columns snapped and as a result, the entire top of the building came down pretty much in free fall because the kinetic energy that was unleashed was just huge. After months of analysis, NIST concluded that the World Trade Center had no structural flaws that could account for its collapse. It was the interplay of impact damage and fire that brought the towers down. It was the combination of the impact, the fireproofing that was dislodged, and the jet fuel fires that caused the buildings to collapse. These buildings were sound, well-designed, highly innovative, and there was nothing that could have changed the outcome of
Us.